A very warm welcome to you and thank you so much for joining our Homeopathy 24-7 podcast. We are going to be speaking to an array of international guests who will share their knowledge and experiences of homeopathy with you. We will discuss all types of subjects such as remedies, symptoms and stories of health. No matter where you are with your homeopathic journey, we aim to inspire you on your quest to natural health and living. The podcast is brought to you by Mary Greensmith, the founder of Homeopathy 24-7, which is a global platform connecting you with a homeopath wherever you are in the world, 24 hours a day. So let's get started with today's chat. Please welcome Mary Greensmith. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for joining me today. I am going to just bring you up to date with my homeopathic life. And I know that I mentioned oh, for a few months ago, our plan to move to a little tiny island. Well, it's taken a long, long time to achieve, but we have actually now moved. Now, the reason it took so long was because in the UK, the housing market was very, very difficult and people trying to buy houses um, if they had a mortgage was um, extremely difficult and the mortgage companies would refuse it at the last minute. So we sold that house very quickly within a day of putting it on the market, which is very, very unusual for the UK and the process with the UK system is that when somebody makes an offer and you accept the offer you have to withdraw the house from market so then takes usually takes nine to ten weeks um, to go through the process of of actually selling the house and somebody else buying it in the UK it's not a good system it is a terrible system and um, just the last within the last week, we were just all set to move. And the people who were buying our buyer's house, they had to withdraw because the people buying their house couldn't get their mortgage. So it all fell through in the last minute. So we put it back on the market. We sold it again. And this actually happened four times. So it was it was quite a traumatic time. But we eventually moved Um, in the middle of January. So that was great. Now, of course, we had most of our boxes packed since August. So it it was a long, a long time to not have all your staff around you. Um, And obviously, you know, we we had the main things that we kept, um, kept out to use, um, mostly the kitchen stuff, all the main furniture, but none of your little tidbits or pictures on the walls and things like that. But anyway, we are all set to move um, mid-January and that was the only traumatic thing about the move there was the fact that the dog, there's no ship that takes passengers to the island during the winter. We were all set to move in August where it wasn't going to be a problem for us to get on a boat and take the car and take the dog and everything else. But, um, But in the winter, that's not possible. And the, there's a little plane that goes to the island and it takes 16 passengers and they will take dogs up to 23 kilos. Now, my dog is a Hungarian Vizsla and she's always been 23 kilos. However, she is now on the, getting rather old and stayed and I knew that she had put on a bit of weight. So... My husband said, don't worry, she's always 23 kilos, it'll be absolutely fine. And I was worried. I was seriously worried. So, of course, the the only one thing we had to do um, to take her to Alderney was to have her wormed three days before by a vet. And the vet has to sign the passport. Um, now, my dog is only ever wormed when she's coming back into the UK. Um, we just do it naturally. We use natural products. We use homeopathy. And we she has a raw carrot every week or every, every you know three or four days. And that really helps reduce worms with your dogs. Just a little tip there. So anyway, she went off to um, have her worming tablets. And of course, we, they weighed her. We went off to have her weighed a couple of weeks beforehand and she was um, 25 kilos. So could we, you know, put her on a diet for, for it was, we only had a couple of weeks. So it was going to be very tight. 
we actually got her down to 24 kilos, not 23, but we thought we'd get away with that possibly. Anyway, so I, of course, was worried about this the whole time um, because I hate conflict. Uh, and I've got one of those faces where you know where I'm worried. You know if I'm displeased. You know if, you know, it, it, you, you can see all of my emotions all over my face at any time. So my husband, we made this plan, whereas I wasn't to be anywhere to be seen when they were weighing the dog. Um, and, you know, Paul would offer to pay for two seats on the plane or something like that, because there's never, you know, there's usually five people on the plane. So it really isn't a problem weight wise. But anyway, when we actually got there, they didn't even weigh the dog. It was, oh, yeah, she's fine. Let's, you know, just put her on and, and you pick her up. You put her in the crate that they have, especially in that plane. There's only room for one and you get on the plane and off you go. So I was worrying for two weeks about that. But in actual fact, there was no need to worry. So we arrived, we we're very pleased to arrive on the island of Alderney. Now, the island of Alderney is three miles long by one and a half miles wide. And it's 70 miles from the UK across the um, Atlantic, um, the sea, English Channel. And it is only seven miles from France, but it's right in the middle of the English Channel. So, so it's very um, susceptible, obviously, to changeable weather, big waves. Um, and but it's just the most amazing place. So I will put up some photographs for you to see the island. Now, the most exciting thing is this island has got about just under 2000 people that live here. And so it's quite a, a, a good community. I have not really done much community work. I have lived in remote places and I have always needed a car to go to a shop. And because I really, <laughs> but I hate shopping, I don't often drive and I don't go far. Of course, we lived in a boat for seven years. So we'd just sail to where we wanted. We'd ding into, you know, the, the remote shops um, and, and just live off the cuff rather like that. So, so for me, the idea of coming to a very um, small community means that I can actually start to get involved with community work. I can start to work with people. And my idea is that obviously I can help other people be more self-sufficient, um, not rely on incoming things. We have a ship once a week that brings um, oh, it brings everything. It brings food in. There's food, two main um, shops for food and it brings wood in for we have a big wood merchants that um, has everything to make things. So builders merchant, really, but it's also got a gardening section and it's got, you know, cookware and, and things like that. So you can buy most things from that shop. And of course, their supplies come in by ship. So there's a ship once a week all year round and there's a little plane. The plane brings the post in every day and it also obviously brings passengers in from Southampton, from the UK and from Guernsey, the nearest um, larger island closest to us in the Channel Islands. So my idea really to, to live on in a small community is that I can be involved a lot more. I can have a garden and be self-sufficient in fruit and vegetables. And I can help with, there's one farm that has cows. There's another farm that has pigs. This is a small farm that has a few sheep and goats. And so we produce our own milk, it produces the, our own meat. And also there is a now there is Alderney roots, which is um, a, a vegetable growing um, two or three acres and it has polytunnels and produces a lot of fresh vegetables. Now, not at the moment, it's not supported by the state, which means that it, it you know, is growing slowly and can't grow quickly. So a lot of people rely on the food that's coming in on the ships. And obviously being naturally minded, 
and being a homeopath, I think this is a great opportunity to actually find out how to be more self-sufficient. Now, I'm not new to this. When I was 21, I moved up to right up to North Scotland to be self-sufficient on a small farm of 25 acres where we had cows, sheep, pigs, chickens, everything else, really to keep us um, as much self-sufficient as we possibly could be. And there was a lovely, lovely self-sufficiency community up there. So I'm really hoping to get back to where I started when I was very young um, without supermarkets, without needing the car, um, without needing all of the, the, the large, you know, sh um, shops and ability to get anything you want where you want it. I do love the idea of having to wait for things. You know, you order something from the UK, you're usually looking at four to five weeks um, for it to be delivered and arrive with you on the island. So, you know, you pay for Amazon Prime, but you're not going to get it. But actually, because we are part of the UK, it is still worth us doing that. Because, of course, if you do have things shipped, it is usually more expensive to ship it. But the island we're on is self-governing and there's no VAT here. There's no additional tax. Um, and so it is a great place to live. And so what else am I hoping to do here? Obviously, we've bought a house. Now, the house, the house is for sale on the island of are, are not too many and not very well kept, not very well done up. And I wanted, obviously, a garden. I love my flowers. I love a flower garden. At, but I really want the opportunity to be able to grow my own veg again. So we needed a plot that was big enough to do that and hopefully have a couple of chickens. Now, we've had chickens quite a few times over the, the past few years, and we know we don't need any more than three chickens. We will. It will be tight here for us to have chickens. My mum has little call ducks, which I would love a couple of call ducks, but I have still got to persuade my husband that that would be a good idea rather than detrimental to his vegetables. My husband does the cooking, so he just wants the vegetables. Um, from the cooking point of view, he just um, loves the whole idea of, of doing um, what he can with the freshest possible vegetables. And he fishes. So between us with the fish, and um, vegetables, we're, we're going to uh, really go back, go back in time to um, producing our own food, to providing our own food. And the lovely thing about arriving in the, in the village is that um, as soon as you're doing anything outside, people stop on the street and talk to you and find out. And it was only within 10 days that Paul had already negotiated somebody bringing fish when they've got leftover fish over, um, which he absolutely loves cooking um, and making magical pate. And he's very, very excited because he realises that they um, fish for bass all year round here, which is very exciting. We love um mackerel bass and we love spider crabs and and um lobster if we can get it which we could when we lived in Cornwall and we had our own little fishing boat and we 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 had we were very very lucky and we had spider crab brown crab and lobster on quite a, a regular basis. So we're really looking forward to having that opportunity again. Now this island, because it is close to France, um, but, but, but in the channel and quite remote, it has the fastest tides in the world. So um, this means that um, when the tide is coming in and out, it has a power of something like six, seven miles an hour. So you, it, it is a quite a dangerous part of the sea. You have to know what you're doing to be sailing around that, to be fishing in that area. So it's not something that you just go out and buy a boat and, and get to know it. Um, it is surrounded by some pretty rough seas here. But it's just so amazing going and being able to walk the dog on the beach, we have 11 beautiful sand beaches and lots of cliff walks. Now, I said it was only three miles long by one and a half miles wide. There are actually 23 miles of footpaths. So 
you can go all over the island and explore and it is just so amazing especially when the wind blows and the wind dubs blow and the waves are just huge and it's just so lovely to see there are lots of places to eat um, and pubs and um, social events in fact there are over 50 clubs in this small small island so there's something for everybody um paul's already joined a clay pigeon shoot and he's already signed up to help with the water taxi to help with the sailors coming in and i've joined an art club and i've joined a horticultural club as well so it's a lovely way to meet the locals um, there are also quite a few horses here. Now, I come from a very horsey background. I had a lot of horses growing up and um, I did have a few yards that I ran before I became a homeopath. And I'm very excited about actually riding again. I haven't ridden a horse for 20 years and I think it would be just such a beautiful place just to be able to go around the island on horseback. That I'm very excited I've seen quite a few horses. I've spoken to a few owners. I haven't found one that's been ridden as yet. So, of course, you know, it's hard work having a horse here. And if they're shod, if you want to ride them around, we have to get a farrier to come onto the island to look after the horses. There is a vet here. There is a hospital. There is an ambulance. There's a doctor's surgery. Um, we don't have the natural national health here as they have in the UK. So we have to pay for those um, doctor and hospital services. Um, what else do they have? So they have two big food shops. They have um, quite a few pubs and eateries, restaurants and um, cafes. They have a couple of clothes shops, a couple of homemade um things um, made on the island they have you know card shops and gift shops a few things like that so not a lot um retail which i love because i hate shopping so that's easy for me um but what's really exciting is being able to just walk down and go and have coffee with somebody or um you know on the beach just go and sit and or walk the dogs on the beach with other people so that's really exciting we have now been here seven weeks and wow it has flown by it's the middle of winter and the first thing we needed to do was to clear the garden the gar the house had been old by owned by a couple of um, old couples, effectively, who hadn't had time to manage the garden. The garden was obviously really good once. Um, and the, the people before the last owners were very elderly. And in fact, they're both in the old people's home that is here on the island. And the last people that we bought it from actually moved here, but then unfortunately be became ill and had to move off the island um, again. So, so the garden hasn't been managed for, I would say, a good five, six, maybe seven years. And, and it is totally overgrown. Somebody has put a lot of box in there. There's small bushes that you keep in a nice shape. And these had all grown huge. And the hedges are probably 10, 12 foot high around the property. And the whole place is covered in brambles. So we have been clearing and strimming. And I, the first thing I did was put a note up to anybody. Does anybody want these box plants? We're going to have to bring them out because it's all double and triple hedges. So there might have been 10 foot of hedge um, and the garden was, was just tiny what was left of it. So we obviously need to clear the inner hedges. So I put a message on Facebook and somebody came along and said, yes, yes, I've got a big garden that needs a lot more shelter. So they would arrange a digger to come and pull out the hedges, which is much better than our idea, because obviously we would have to kill them to get them out if we were digging them out by hand. And so th this worked really, really well, except, of course, the diggers completely wrecked the garden that you have got. So it's complete mess. But now I am left with um, the, the, the big hedging around the outside. And then there's a hedge down the middle of the garden. 
and I'll try and find you a picture of this so you can see. But the exciting thing is I found an olive tree in there. That's beautiful. And there's a fig tree under the Pittosporum tree. Now, Pittosporums are usually bush size. This one was oh, 15, 20 foot high, so it's a big tree now. So we're going to try and bring that down and get it more manageable and not taking up um, too much sunlight so that we can have more things growing. And this property um, is blessed with the most amazing greenhouse. So I'm very excited um, to have a greenhouse. It's a long time since I've had a greenhouse. And I've already got a whole, a whole shelf of sweet peas and lots of vegetables starting in the greenhouse already. It is being used as well as a storage shed at the moment because we haven't got a shed. We have to have planning to put up a shed. We have to have planning to pull down any um, proper trees, um, which there's only one that we will need to bring down because it towers over the house um, and it is a little bit dangerous. The house itself is a wooden house. It's what's called a cult house. And and um, this means that um, we, we don't have many of these in the UK. I know that around the world, a lot of houses are made of wood. Um, for my husband, it's perfect because he doesn't mind doing boats up, but he hates doing houses up. So for me, it's a good compromise. Um, I don't mind because it's a real character house and um, it, it's lovely and warm. I was very worried about it not being lived in for quite a while. I was going to be freezing cold and not able to, to be warm. It has got a wood burner, a small wood burner, but we were slightly worried about that because there aren't enough trees to maintain a wood burning stove on the island. So environmentally, I'm not sure that that's the right way to go, that having a wood burner is sustainable when there's not enough wood on the island for people to use. If you've got to import wood, it doesn't seem to me to be the best way of doing it. It's much better if we put up some solar panels and we get have energy in different ways. Um, but it's a hard choice, isn't it? Because the heating is some oil, the electric is, is, is mains electric from the island, but they're importing oil to make the electric. So what's going to happen about that? They're talking about having a wind turbine, but obviously I'm not sure whether, whether that's a great idea for the island. Um, it would be perfect, I think, if they did a wave, um, use the waves to get the power for electric, that would be phenomenal. We've got the best waves in the world <laughs> and the currency, the race, they call it, um, the tide coming in and out. Um, is, is I'll get the figures um, for how much the tide rises, but it's a, it's a huge amount. Um, so it's, it's just very exciting to be part of this community. And I look forward to sharing with you how it develops um, around. There is a doctor, as I say, on the, uh, on the island. Um, and, but I know that a lot of people are really interested in the natural health. And there are lots of yoga um, instructors and um, Pilates people and people who are really looking at how they can stay healthy themselves. So I'm really looking forward to joining that community as well. The other thing that I've joined straight away is a co-working group, which is quite exciting because they're already realising that actually if people can work here, remotely then it brings more money to the island and of course that can mean it can be more sustainable so um, they are looking at ways to make the island um, easier for people to come and work remotely or work for other organizations but effectively be paid out of the island and bring the money into the island and that will help um, form a community that can be more self-sufficient. Obviously, the main worry for the island is that the population is very elderly. The um, old people's home has a waiting list. I don't know how much the waiting list is, but you can see why. You, you know, you wouldn't want to go anywhere else once you've been here and you know that you can be with everybody that um, is really well looked after. And the, the old people's home is like, you know, the, the whole focus of the island. Everybody supports it. It's a huge charity. 
um, because everybody wants to, you know, if they have to go into a home, they won't want to go back to the UK um, or be anywhere else. Um, it just has the most amazing position. And, um, you know, it, it would just be a lovely place to get old, I feel. So that's very exciting um, that we have this um, ability really to be able to stay on the island forever. But as I say, at the moment, it means that the population is an elderly population and the youngsters have got to make quite a lot of money to be able to live and survive here. And so you will find that um, obviously food is more expensive because that is the, the food in the shops is shipped in from other countries. And the workmen here do charge quite a lot of money um, because, uh, you know, the, the, you have no choice, really. Um, but they have to buy the machinery in, they have to get everything in and shipped over, which, of course, adds to their costs as well. So the exciting thing I've found so far, we've got the state's office. Now, the state's office is like the island government and that they run everything. And we have a green waste cycle. So we've been taking all the brambles and all of the rubbish away to the green waste cycle. And there they have a huge machine that makes um, wood chip and it makes, um, it, you know, um, compost so there are banks and banks of compost that have been there for years and years so you can just arrange for them to fill um, a, a trailer with soil and bring that back to the house and you can take dustbins down and get lots of wood check to, to do baths and things like that and, and create a nice mulch um, over the garden so I'm really excited about that to me, that's my first um, experience of the self-sufficiency of the island. Everybody looking after everybody else, everybody taking care, using other people's um, things. And already we found that the marketplace on the Facebook for the island is really exciting. You can put something on there and it's gone within five minutes. People pop round and say, yep, yep, I'll have that. Thank you. That's lovely. And one chap came to pick up something that Paul had put on to Marketplace and he said, oh, well, yes, I recognise this. I put the floor down. Uh, oh, years ago, 20 years ago, maybe. So he said, oh, we're really pleased with the floor. It's a beautiful wooden floor. So we asked him what else he did and we've booked him in to do some work and we're going to just rearrange the kitchen, knock a few walls about um, and open it up a little bit and put some more floor down. So he's all booked in um, and, and it was easy because, you know, he came and found us. So just already only being here six weeks, we feel so much part of this community. It's just so exciting. My husband's quite worried because just oh, less than 50 yards down the road is Fraggle Rock. And Fraggle Rock is effectively the local garden centre. So what he's worried about is that my, my garden centre is just a wheelbarrow um, away. You know, I can just take my wheelbarrow down there and come back with it full of plants, um, which he is quite worried about, because although I hate shopping, I do love plant shopping. And um, so I'm very excited about that. So they've already popped around to see what we're doing um, and invited us around for drinks and um, to talk about plants as much as we want to. So I'm um, in really good hands there. I'm very excited about, um, about just building a garden. I've got the framework and I've got the edges and I've got some really good shrubs um, already established. And, and we bought with us, I bought with me a hmm, hundred pots maybe. Um, 50 of those were full of plants. Um, 50 I emptied and, um, and, and, you know, just bought the empty plant. So it's going to be beautiful. So I look forward to showing you that as the season progresses. My last garden was very tiny. It was just a yard um, front and back and I filled it completely. So here I've got about six times the amount of space that I did have um, there. So it's going to take me much longer to get to grips with and fill up. But that's very exciting.
So if you want to see some of the pictures and the photographs, um, then have a look at this podcast on YouTube because you can find it there and you'll be able to watch our progress over the next few years. Thank you for joining us. Lovely to see you here. Please do put any questions you've got below and you can click through and find out more about our naturally minded living on the island of Alderney. Next week, I'm going to be talking to Claire Gregory. Claire is going to be telling us about how she works with people with fertility using homeopathy. Homeopathy is such a great medicine for actually balancing hormones and helping improve fertility for both women and men. And um, what's important and what we talk about quite a lot is the journey through fertility, improving fertility and how homeopathy is so useful. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Have a great week. I do hope you've enjoyed these episodes and I do hope you can subscribe to our channels. Now, there are various ways for you to listen to our podcast or watch it on video on YouTube. So whether it's iTunes, Spotify or YouTube, please do subscribe and please do leave us a review. If you leave us a review on these platforms, then more people will see our podcast. We just want more people to share the joy of homeopathy. It's a choice that everybody should know about. Please do everything you can to help us help more people. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and look forward to listening to our next one. Please don't forget to follow our podcast on your chosen channel and please do leave us a review so we can continue to share homeopathy with as many people as possible. If you do have any questions, please do reach out to us on any of our social platforms mentioned in the show notes. We at Homeopathy 24-7 hope to empower you on your natural health journey.